My name is Zach Hanna. I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. Thank you for joining us on this lovely, um, or rather quite rainy, um, Friday uh, late afternoon slash early evening. Uh, we're being joined by Dr. Joy Tan, who's a, a, a pediatrician, a community specialist, um, who has multiple qualifications um, and is deeply interested in medical education and has previously and is currently teaching at GSTT, is that correct, Dr. Tan? Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, she has a special interest in technology-enhanced learning and is currently doing a PhD in neurodisability. So there is no one greater at the moment to talk about pediatric surgery than Dr. Tan. Whenever you're ready, Dr. Tan. Hello, everyone. My name is Joy. Don't need to call me Dr. Tan. Um, I think uh, everybody's equal. We are all in the learning phase, and I think that's the attitude that I would try to keep myself um, because we are really sincerely learning every day. So there's no need for to address me as Dr. Tan. I'm Joy. Um, my name is Joy Tan. I am currently working in Barking and Dagger from as a specialty uh, community uh, pediatrician. Um, I am still teaching and uh, doing ad hoc teaching in GSTT, but previously I was an education fellow in the Evelina Children's Hospital. So now I'm going to talk to you about pediatric surgery and you can use the Q&A function, I don't really mind, but things that I want to cover in this hour includes um, really the gist is just remem remember three things. Common things are common, so what is so common about general surgery? Next thing is what are the surgical emergencies that you need to know about? Absolutely. And we touch a bit about neonatal surgery. So I'm only going to show you about common stuff that I would expect you to learn more at your own time. And I'm also going to highlight to you what are the ways that I think it's most useful for uh, medical students to understand or to learn. So, um, yes. So now general surgery of childhood, if you want to tell me using the chat box or Q&A function, you could tell me what are your main concerns and why do you think it's so difficult to study gem peeps surgery? Anybody? Anybody? Well, when I was last teaching and um, Oh yeah, somebody said they are more fragile. Yes, absolutely. That's really, really good. Um, they are difficult to get an accurate history from. Yes, Olivia, bang on. They are very difficult to get an accurate history and an accurate examination. Um, Rebecca, I'm so sorry you can't hear what we are talking about. Um, but is everyone else able to hear? Give me a hit, yes or no. Okay, so I think Rebecca, I think it's uh, maybe if um, Zach could attend to Rebecca to help her with some technical issues, but yes. But yes, it is very fragile. And most of the time, I think the most important thing is we can't get an accurate history from the child itself or we can get a quite an accurate history from mom and dad. It's a very inaccurate examination. So sometimes it's very subjective. As we all do, we do not like cold hands on our tummy or cold hands around our body. That works the same for baby and that works the same for a child. And the, their common reaction is to cry. And when they cry, everything tends up. So it's very subjective. Now, we're going to do a bit of a spot diagnosis. Now, if anybody wants to tell me what is this or what do you think this is or how would you approach it? Well done, I see some answers. Inguina hernia, any other different show? Oh, I like this answer. So Kang says you need to transilluminate. So that's what you want to do. Very good. 
What else do you want to do? Any ideas? I must say I'm very impressed so far, but well done. Any takers? Chromatic reflexes? How paid? Yes. So what are you guys thinking? From your answers, I think everybody is thinking about two things. One, is it inguinal hernia? Two, is it a hydrosteel? Okay, so what do you do is, like what Kang say, you do a uh, transaminate, and if there's light going through, then it's probably a hydrosteel. Yes, you also palpate, and then you try feeling, and most of the time, what you're looking for is, is there any change of color? Is it tense? Is it red? Is it hot? Is it tender? Now, this next slide will help you to think about what is actually happening. So yes, it's the testicular region. In the normal physiology circumstances, this thing, which is processus vaginalis, is obliterated. Okay, so means it doesn't exist. But if this passage is patent, what will happen is there is accumulation of fluid and it may cause hydrocele. Now, if you have a widely patent processus vaginalis, what happens is your whole bowel content is able to invaginate through it. So that's why you have inguinal hernia and hydrocele. Is that clear? So if you're going to use the light, like what we see in the previous slide, okay, if there's only water content in it, yes, you can transimulate, yes, that's hydrocele. But if you have your bowel content there, I don't think any light could pass through it. So does that make sense again? Yes. Okay. Cool, simple. So that's one test that you will do. And then how do you manage it now? For management, ideally, now if it is an inguinal hernia, okay, you can feel it, okay. And then the most important thing that you need to think of if it is an inguinal hernia that you're suspecting, then you see if you can push the bowel back, okay. If the bowels are reducible and it's back, Okay, now if it is not reducible, then you need to think about surgical intervention. Now, if it is reducible, let's go for the easy stuff first. Okay, usually we do not touch the baby until they are one years of age, and then we do the surgical, pro, um, sur surgical procedure. For hydrocele, usually it will resolve. So we will tell patients coming into our clinic, yes, that's a hydrocele. Yes, I can see the light. Don't worry, we'll see you again in a year. If it doesn't resolve, we'll put you in for waiting list for hydrocele procedure, which is the ligation of PPV. So it's prayed. So PPV, again, you will see a lot on the notes. And basically, that means patent processes vaginalis. Okay. Now, if you're suspecting of the incarcerated inguinal hernia, it's when usually it's not reducible. Number one, the, the baby is usually very irritable, okay, not feeding. The tummy can be a bit big, but usually I think what I will look for is an unwell child, not feeding. Vomiting can be a bit not sensitive, but crying and irritability will be one thing that parents notice. It's ongoing, they're not feeding, they're not happy. And parents, because they know babies has inguinal hernia and we give them the red flags, okay, this will happen when your baby cry, when your baby cough, when your baby poo, when your baby wee, it gets bigger. So they will notice. And what they tell you is, I noticed that the groin area is more red, it's getting bigger. And it's very difficult to push it in. So which means parents try to reduce it, but it doesn't happen. So that's what parents will tell you in their history. Okay. And this is how it looks like. Usually it doesn't turn purple, okay, all the time. 
okay, but you just need to be aware. I think the most sensitive thing that I will see is the baby. If the baby is really unwell, and in something that I look at on examination, the signs that I'm looking for is really tenderness, redness, and very firm, that will be it. So what do I do? Is number one, new by mouth, okay? Ask mom when is the last feed, stop feeding. IV fluids, NG tube, and then give them some analgesia. Very rarely we, we use morphine, but very commonly we give IV paracetamol. And then you call the surgical registrar. The surgical registrar will attempt to reduce it. Now, again, it's the same concept. If it is irreducible, you really go straight for operation. Usually it takes some time, the registrar, the SHO asks the registrar, the registrar asks the consultant, and then they make a decision. But usually it is quite straightforward. Now, is this a medical emergency? Now, if there is an obvious change of color, it is a medical emergency. Now, if it is no obvious of change color and it's reducible, it's something that can you can wait. Okay. Now, what is this? This is also very common. You can see most of the time, but I just want to know what do you think this is and how would you approach it? So undescended testicles, undescended testicles. Christine said there is umbilical hernia. I think you're in the wrong region of the body. So I don't think that's it. But yes, it's undescended testicles. Okay, well done, everybody. Now, so you need to see many to know what it is. Okay. Sorry, I have an anonymous attendee that say, if it is irreducible, do we follow the six and two rule? Six and two rule, you mean for fasting? Am I right? So... If you want to answer to that, um, is it a fasting? That's what you are asking about. Sorry, anonymous attendee. So I don't know your name. Now, anyway, so this is an undescended testicles. Okay, so what do you want to know when you're suspecting an undescended testicle? What do you think is most important? Unilateral, bilateral, age of patient, yes, equally important. But what is the most important thing that you need to do? What is the most important thing that you think you need to perform on the patient, maybe? Yeah, is it palpable? Okay, so please remember, if you're doing pediatrics, please be, remember these golden terminology. I would like to perform a by manual examination, okay? So, which means you use two hands to do and feel for the testis. One is to secure and one is to feel for the testis, okay? It's never nice to use one hand to just feel for the testis because, as I said, because chromatic reflexes do exist and if anybody is scared of cold hands and if chromatic reflex do exist, it's really just shoot up, okay? So don't be too afraid. Sometimes if you're a junior SHO, it's fine if you can't feel for the testis, just ask for someone more senior to feel it. Now, so if you really can't feel it, and I, and I asked my reg, my reg still can't feel it, what should I do next? So if I can't feel it on my by manual, very good, so I could use an ultrasound. Yes, imaging will be good. Ultrasound will be my imaging of choice, very good. Now, if I can see a test is, what do you think a surgeon might do next? Yes, star ochidopexy is very common, but when do you think? Do you think it's an emergency or do you think you can wait? 
yeah, after a certain age, well done, you can wait, okay? So what do we usually do is if it is something that we see in newborn examination, six weeks check and all the vaccination, GP usually say, yeah, I can't feel like can't feel for the testes. Yeah, so they arrange for an ultrasound. They know that the, the testes is just hiding somewhere, but it's common. So what do they do is usually we don't do anything until the age of two. Now we have an ideal cut off age is always to be seen at one year of age in the pediatric clinic and then to be reviewed after that. Now, if at that time, one years of age, it is still not coming down, then we will schedule them for elective procedure, okay? Now, so this is where it's usually hiding. It can be supraskeletal, it could be inguinal, it could be abdominal. Now, there's also this thing called atopic. It might be hiding somewhere that is not supposed to be. So you need to be aware of it. And what do we do is usually if it is palpable, we do an orchidopexy. If it is not palpable, we will do an examination under anesthetic. Okay, we do an exploration and then we usually will do an orchidopexy if we find it. And if we don't find it, at the same time, we will do an orchidopexy on the contralateral side, simply because we know that this child have only one testicle less left, so it's important to fix the other side so that it doesn't go missing or go somewhere else. Usually that's the procedure. Now, can I just ask a question? If we really can't find on one side, what are the medical investigation that you usually do? Or is there any medic any investigation that we usually do? CT, MRI. So can I just say is medical? So what medical what medical person loves to do? We love bloods. Are there any bloods that we we'll like to do? Yeah, sometimes we do hormone level. Sometimes we do refer to endocrinology. Sometimes we even go as extreme as cryotyping. So now when it is not extreme, which means that if it's not felt bilaterally and it's not found bilaterally, that's when we usually do a genetic test. And that did happen before, I've seen before. So it's not something uncommon that I haven't seen before, okay? Now, that's enough of test this area. Now, can I ask you what is this? Common things are common. Common things are very common. Umbilical hernia, very good. Do we do anything about it? Yes or no? No need, no need. So what will the surgeon say to the patient? Classical. No, not a massage it star, no. So what we usually say to the patient is watch and wait, okay? So watch and wait. So the next question I'm going to ask is watch and wait till when? Till what age then I can't watch and wait? So Christine say five years. Abinaya says three to five. Yes. So I can always say watch and wait until I know that they are going to school. So some parents would like it to be... Um, to perform a procedure simply because of cosmetic reason, okay? And I've seen that before uh, because sometimes it's just not too nice if you are putting on a swimming suit uh, or if you are going for swimming for boys, it's just not something pleasant to see. Unfortunately, umbilical hernia is also more common in the Asian and African ethnicity. So just to bear in mind that, okay? 
Now, I'm also going to throw you some medical questions. So Amber Laika Hania, can you think of any medical condition that is that have a that puts on a high higher risk of somebody having umbilical -like hernia? So two kind of medical condition. Buria says Down syndrome. Well done. Another one. Something to do with hormone levels. Kang not connective tissue disorder. Some, but I I see your logical thinking process there. But I'm I'm giving you a tip. It's hormone, hormones, hormones. Korea says, oh well done A. So Surya says uh, metabolic. Nope. Um, Turner's nope. Uh, it's hypothyroidism and it's congenital hypothyroidism that is commonly associated with umbilical hernia. So well done, A. Good, good, good. Very impressive. Now, so most of them, they are more, most common hernia in childhood. So there's something to know. Majority spontaneously closed by five years of age. There's a very, very, very low risk of incarceration. Okay, so that is the thing that all I want you to know. Now, I'm going to also ask you to think about abdominal pain because I think that's the most common presentation that we often see or often call a surgeon to review, okay? But they also get a bit annoyed if you ask for every single abdominal pain to be seen. Now, I want you to think about a few things, okay? So when you learn about any medical condition, try for pediatrics, not other population for pediatrics, try to think of the five main population in neonatal group, in toddler, childhood, and uh, teenager, sorry, so four age group, neonates, toddler, childhood, and teenager, okay? So these are the things that you need to think about, and I will go through things that are more interesting and more common if somebody presents with an abdominal pain, and you need to call for surgeon. Okay, so have a look at this slide. Have a little think about it. Of all the condition, what do you think is the most, most, most common presentation or diagnosis out of the whole long list here? So some say it's constipation. I know it's very common. Gastroenteritis, I also know it's very common. Pneumonia, yes, I also know. But finally, Kayla told me that it's non-specific abdominal pain. So I say kudos to you because yes, that's the most common abdominal pain, which is non-specific abdominal pain. It's very, very common. Most of the time we could even have a whole clinic that is referred to GMP, it's gastro, and even pediatric surgery, they are all non-specific abdominal pain, okay? So that's the most common presentation, but now today we're talking about pediatric surgery. So again, think about the 4-H group, and this is case one. Have a little read. Now, any takers? What do you think this is? Yep, so appendicitis is good. Non-specific abdominal pain is probably no because this child has a temperature of 38.4. And the next slide will highlight to you why I think it's not. So need to think again, so very importantly, Look at the age group. It's acute onset of right side abdominal pain. So usually non-specific will be more a chronic pre presentation. Now it's quite acute because he was a bit uncomfortable, go to school and then progresses struggling to walk, 
and lost his appetite. He doesn't want to be moved or touched, okay? Temperature, yes, he is having a slight temperature. So everybody knows it's appendicitis. Now, Kang has said that it's with peritonism. Wow. How do you know that? Or do you know what are the signs of peritonitis? I'm not saying symptoms of peritonitis. One, yes, from this history, staying still, but one main symptom of peritonitis is guarding, rebound tenderness, okay? So all these you need to think about. Now, for an MCQ question in the older age, probably even more senior than me, we will ask what are what is the likely diagnosis? But unfortunately, because of how well we teach nowadays, we do not ask what is the likely diagnosis. So I'm going to ask you to list me what are the differential diagnoses apart from appendicitis. Because these are the things that I want you to think about, that the surgeon wants you to rule that out first before calling them. So UTI, testicular torsion, gastroenteritis, mesenteric adenitis, Renal stone, very rare, but UTI bite. Olivia, I like your answer because it's very important. And I've been caught out once. So yes, right lower lobe pneumonia is very important. Okay. So what are my first steps? Okay. I need to think about my different shows. And I think all of you have listed down what I want. So yes, well done. Gastroenteritis, testicular torsion, UTI, right lower lobe pneumonia, mesenteric adenitis, and colitis. Okay, that doesn't mean I want all of you to do a, a, perform a chest X-ray on all abdominal pain. Okay, that's not my point. That is really not my point. But what I want you to think about before referring to a surgeon is to think about all these common things that they often question you about on the phone. Okay, so gastroenteritis, you need to ask about, is he vomiting? Is he also having diarrhea? Okay, next, test, testicular torsion. All you have to do is just do a groin examination. If there's no concern, that's fine. Okay, UTI, you just do a urine dipstick. It's quite fast. If it is an eight-year-old boy, you don't need to wait for long to see one. Now, right lower lobe pneumonia, if you do not focus on the abdominal symptoms and try to listen to the lung, I think it's quite, yeah, it, it would be quite evident if this has made a child don't want to touch or don't want to be touched or don't want to be moved, okay? Mesentery adenitis is a very common differential site and don't feel bad about it if you don't know it because very often a surgeon only find this when they are in the theater, operation theater. So don't feel bad about it. But yes, it should be part of the different show. Colitis picture. Now, because of our pandemic, a lot of kids has been brought in with a colitis abdominal pain picture. And sometimes again, because it's a very unreliable physical examination and with the high CRP, um, there are few... Um, what we call is a PIMS DS. So it's, um, it's a COVID related presentation of hyperinflammatory syndrome, which shows as a colitis picture. But unfortunately, sometimes it's so difficult to differentiate that when you bring into theater, that's when you realize it's probably okay. Okay. So just because of the pandemic, I just throw in colitis because it's really quite common now. Now, Think about appendicitis. What else are you looking off, looking at? Okay, so these are the things that probably you should work up before calling the surgeon. So think about, is the abdominal pain moving anywhere? Are there nausea and vomiting, tenderness in the right iliac fossa? Look for guarding because that's a sign of peritonitis. Do, do some blood tests, please, if you are the uh, FYs or the SHO, please do some Bloods. What we are looking for is high, high the uh, white cells and elevated neutrophils, elevated CRP, 
and, and also a high temperature. Now, just to draw into you so that we can teach you just a bit more than what is required of you. Now, CRP, what is the normal level? What's level that is more concerning? So let's, I, let's say I say this boy has a CRP of 20 versus a CRP of 70 versus a CRP of 100. What do you think? CRP of 20, let's begin with that. Is that concerning or non-concerning? Yeah, non-concerning. It could be a viral picture. CRP of 70. Slightly worried, okay? So this is the time when I will have to match it with the white cell count. Is it elevated? And the neutral fuse, is it high, okay? If the lymphocyte is high and the neutral fuse are not high, then probably, okay, not too bad. But if white cells and neutral fuse are high, Yes, probably swaying to a right direction. Okay, so obviously, if the CRP of hundreds is very concerning. Now, can I just ask another question? So let's say if you feel the appendix, sorry, if you feel the right side of the tummy, you can feel a mass. What do you do? So on examination, you feel a mass. You do. Yep. So you do ultrasound first, and they already show you, yeah, it's appendic mass. So for appendic mass, do you treat it conservatively or do you treat it with surgery? In kids. Angela says, depends on severity. Star says, surgery. Jatpath said, surgery. Okay, so everybody says surgery. Okay, now, can I just change your frame of mind? Now, if it is appendic mass, we know with a very high CRP, surgeons in a child setting would be quite reluctant to touch the child. Simply because if it is not perforating, okay, the child is in no danger, all we have to do is give antibiotics and treat conservatively for six weeks, and then we re-image the patient. And if it is small enough, then they do the appendicectomy. Okay? Now, if it is perforated, it's a different scenario, okay? So that will depend, that will be what Angela say. It's very severe, you just do it and you do an open laparotomy and probably have to do a significant washout, okay? So surgery only if it is perforated, yes. But if it is appendic mass, child is okay, we usually treat them with long, long, long course of antibiotics, okay? Well, we are asked why we wait. So basically, if it is non-perforated, okay, we try to reduce the inflammation before going into the tummy. Imagine if we go into a tummy with an appendic mass that obviously the bigger it is, they have a tendency to perforate. Perforate means also instability for the patient's safety. So which one has a higher risk? Course, if I know studies have shown me that antibiotic is going to work if the patient is well and there is there is no signs of perforation, why not wait? You have to bear the risks and the benefits when you're doing a surgery, okay? And that goes the same as well. If it is a very young baby presented with or even have imaging that proven that this baby has appendicitis usually they will tend to wait simply because the risk is higher than the benefit. Now, smiley face asks me, how long do I give antibiotics? Usually six weeks, okay? But they reassess 
every two weeks for an imaging to see whether it's reusable in size. First two weeks, you will have to stay in the hospital, okay, because you want to maintain and make sure your CRP is coming down, okay? If your CRP is coming down, which means that it's working for you, if the CRP is not coming down, they have to rediscuss the case with the radiologist. Good, good, good. Now I have Q&A, where is it? Again, anonymous attendee asked me, antibiotic completely cure the condition or surgery is ultimately needed? Surgery is ultimately needed. So after six weeks, they will repeat the imaging and then if it is safe and small enough to intervene, they will intervene. Okay, very gruesome picture, I'm so sorry. So the management will be new by mouth, IV antibiotics, IV fluids and Pendicetamine. Now, anybody knows what kind of antibiotics do we give them, please? Yep, metronidazole, coemox, or amoxicillin. Very good. One more, one more. Anaerobes. Anaerobes cover. Start with G. We all like that. Surgeons like that. Doctors don't like that. Gentamicin. Well done. Okay, so that you go. Now, another case. Have a little read. Okay, now, so nine months, high light, okay, not well. Presenting with, now this is a classical presentation, okay? Palate irritability and crying. Very classic. Next, when you drink, they vomit, okay? Next thing that I want you to think about is this child has a low-grade temperature, tachycardic, and a poor cap refill time, okay? Abdominal is tense, of, of course it's tense. It's painful, so it's tense, okay? It's guarding. Now, but this pain is often intermittent. And when the pain comes, or if it is really, really intense, this baby will tend to draw up his legs. Okay, given this presentation, what do you think the diagnosis? Interception, well, well done. Okay, now again, because of how smart you guys are, we no longer ask you for the likely diagnosis. Okay, we usually ask one step more. Now, Sushikuma, so you say reflux. Hmm. Now, can I just say, if it is reflux, right, it will be under six months. Reflux is one in two in the normal population of babies up to six months of age. Why? Because they are mostly lying down and up to six months of age, they should be sitting up. That's when you see a gradual improvement. Okay, does that make sense? It's a bit of a common sense, but that's why it's not not reflux. Now, what are your first steps? Oh, Angela say pyloric stenosis. Okay. Hmm. I will tell you now, Angela, in, in a couple of minutes. What are your first steps? So intersusception, yes. Ultrasound, palpate, yes. So when you palpate, yes, you can sometimes feel a mess. You do, you have to look at the stool, can, yes, but, 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 please, please, it's a very late sign. So if you see, see the stool is very red, I think you need to go to theater. You can't do something else, okay? So yes, you do ultrasound. And what you're looking for is the donut sign. Angela, correct. Yes, you put them on IRI fluids. Not just IV fluids, I will put them on triple antibiotics. So as an SHO, I was very busy. When I see an intersusception, I just go, oh my God. Because first thing I have to do is in a toddler, not easy, very puffy. And I have to put the IV cannula, put them on IV, triple antibiotics and wait for my wretch to review the child. And then my wretch review the child. And then we have to talk to the radiologist and I have to bring down the child and witness the whole procedure. So we need a radiologist to do that or IR. 
So what do you think we can do? Intervention. Oh, Christine, well done. Rectal air insufflation. I haven't seen that the I haven't seen somebody express it that way. Yes. So yes, 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 rectal air insufflation. Very well done. Okay. Now, just to go back again, I want you to think about what I want you to remember. Think about the case, think about what I said, think about what is important and what you see on the textbook. So in the textbook, it will be, yeah, they tell you the pig age is 10 months and then toddler is colicky pain. So colicky pain will come intermittently, okay? They do have them vomiting. Sometimes you can feel palpable mass. Sometimes it's tender. Usually it's guarding and blood institutes is a late sign. No, you don't do hydro rejection, but you do air reduction. So yes, what do you do is new by mouth, NG, paracetamol and Unfortunately, usually we do give morphine because uh, air enema reduction is quite painful, okay? Um, maintenance, yes, we put them on uh, IV maintenance and we also add, add a bit of potassium because they tend to have electrolyte imbalance. We straight away do bloods with cross match. It's very important for an SHO to do that because if the air enema reduction fails, we need to go to, yeah, we need to go to theater is ASAP because there's always a 5% chance of air enema reduction failure. And there's always a 5% chance of air enema causing perforation. So that is, a, yeah, it's an emergency really, okay? So again, IV antibiotics it never change. It's always Coimox, Gent, or Metronidazole. Now, A enema in reduction is very, very interesting. I've seen it many times before. It's not a pleasant thing that you do. Is yes, use you, you basically you stick a, a flexible tube and you start injecting air and hopefully try to. Im reverse this imaginations of bowel. So it's not that pleasant really. Now the baby usually cry, okay? So you have to tolerate them cry while you are doing this. Parents are usually not allowed to be in the room. So it's usually you that is trying to console the baby with the IR consultant. They will try three times. And if three times they are unsuccessful, they will not try again. And usually, thankfully, there's a 90% of success rate. So that's how it looks, not too nice. Okay, please remember, if they ask you what is intersection, you can tell them it's an invagination of a bowel to, yeah, from the distal end to the proximal end. Now, okay, now, my dear, what's your name again? Angela, I think, yes. So have a look at this case and I will tell you what are the differences. Okay, short and sweet, four-week-old baby presents with two-week history of worsening milky projectile vomiting. Mommy says that he's very hungry but cannot tolerate to feed and he has lost a lot of weight, appears dehydrated on presentation. Now, give me your differential diagnosis, please. Oh, everybody got it. Pyloric stenosis, pyloric stenosis, pyloric stenosis. Oh, there's a duodenal trees here. Maybe not, star. Now, can I just ask, okay, usually this case we will put, we'll ask for a diagnosis, okay, because the very common next answer that medical students answer will be reflux, okay? But can you tell me why is this not a reflux? Or what is it in the presentation that doesn't fit reflux? Projectile vomiting is one, okay, but who is that to judge? Loss of weight, yes, Abinaya, loss of weight is very important, okay, because it's gastroesophageal reflux, there's no loss of weight, but if it is a gastroesophageal reflux disease, there is loss of weight, okay. Now, next, dehydrated on presentation, yes. So all these little things doesn't fit the scenario. 
usually reflux baby, they're very pudgy babies, but they're just happily vomiting all the time. Okay, now pyloric stenosis, it usually presents two to eight weeks. Boys, boys, I'm sorry, boys, but yes, you are at high risk to get it. It's usually a non bilious vomiting projectile, and the child is always hungry, weight loss, they are dehydrated. They really look undernourished. And sometimes, sometimes it's not very sensitive. So don't try to do it when you're an SHO and say, oh, maybe I should do an olive. Yeah, try to look for an olive shape during a test feed. No, it's not sensitive, okay? So probably don't do it, but I tell you what is sensitive or what do you think is more sensitive? So what investigation will help you to confirm your diagnosis? Ultrasound, yes, but what if the radiologist, I'm really busy. Oh, Olivia, metabolic alkalosis. Okay, Abinaya, very good, is very, very close. Okay, very close. This blood gas that we do, but usually in babies, we do a venous blood gas. Imagine this baby is only two weeks old. Ooh. Yeah, you can do a capillary blood gas. Blood gas will be fine, but very rarely we do arterial blood gas, okay? Now, okay, so we do blood gas, okay? You do U and E. Okay, you do an ultrasound. You do a test feed. So usually they have electrolyte imbalance and Sarah has already helped me because you're vomiting, so you're looking for low potassium. Now, I think there is another person that really uh, has already done this for me. I can't remember. Yes, Olivia said it is uh, metabolic alkalosis. And how do you know that? Is you do blood gas and you see hypokalemic, hypochromic metabolic alkalosis, which means that you have low potassium, and low chloride, okay? Now, another question that you ask is, why do you do VBG rather than ABG? Angela, if you have seen a baby, okay? Number one, it's very difficult to feel the pulse, okay? Number two, it's very, very difficult to, to find a vein even. And if we find a vein in a dehydrated child, what you usually do is you can insert to do a blood and you can also do two, two birds and one stone basically. If you could diagnose it with a VBG, why not? Okay. And this doesn't just apply for, a, for, for this condition. Um, a lot of times uh, in, uh, let's say, those ventilator patients and kids, we really tend to do VBG rather than ABG. Or sometimes we even do cap gas. Now, now, now. Okay, pyloric stenosis is usually the management. Okay, think carefully what, no, listen carefully to what I'm going to say. So first thing is, yes, you do NG tube and then you put them on IV fluids. My next question is, do you bring them to theater straight away? Yes or no? Yeah. So Huria and smiley faces say no because of them. If there is metabolite, imbalance, we usually don't fix them until they're stabilized, okay? So once their, their, their potassium and their sodium is normalized, then we will bring them to theater. So again, is this a medical emergency? It's a bit of a yes and no. Now, 13-year-old boy presents with acute onset, severe lower abdominal pain. He's very unwell. Now his pain, he said it's 10 out of 10, 13 year old. Things to look out for is a 13 year old, it's acute onset and he says it's lower abdominal pain. Yes, Abinaya, I need to think about UTI and testicular torsion, but your first thing in a teenager is to rule out test testicular torsion until proven otherwise. Now, it may look like that, but in theater, it might look like that. Okay, 
So this is the one thing. If you see a child, 13 year old with lower abdominal pain, you need to do a groin examination until proven otherwise, okay? You need to make sure there's no unilateral swelling of the uh, groin area. If there is, please ask for your senior to take a look at them. Why? Because they only have a six hour window period to save the testes, okay? And I have saved three times before, okay? Not all of them are that successful. So it's really, really important. Time is, time is really like a ticking bomb. Now, usually what happens for testicular torsion is the twisting of testes around the spermatic cord. It's not nice. And what we don't want to happen is the vascular supply is compromised, okay? Usually it tends to present with pain first. The chromatic reflex is absent, okay? The testis is elevated, okay? Red and dusky is not usually present, okay? I have seen one purple spot before, but redness and dusky color is not really that sensitive. I think if you suspect one, when it's pain, when it's swollen, it's elevated, I think that it, that's, that's it. I will call for a surgical review, okay? And for this case, usually surgical reds are quite obliged. They are quite quick to come. Now, I don't think you have time to do that. But if you have a very skilled surgical registrar, sometimes they will bring down the machine and then do it. So what happens is they want to look for blood flow. And if there's a lack of blood flow, very, very commonly, by the time you bring them to theater, you might see a non-viable testis. Okay, so it's very important to think about six hour window period. And um, I think when you suspect for one, the first thing is probably get a quick eye review, even from the consultant or anybody else and bring the surgical registrar. Now I'm going to end off this talk with neonatal surgery. Okay, so neonatal surgery, I think there are two things that you can't avoid and you need to know, okay? Should you do transillumination, Abhinaya? Mm -hmm. Hydrocele happening in a teenager is quite rare, Abhinaya. Sorry. Now, neonatal surgery. I'm going to go by case because this is very important. And very common. Very common final med question as well. Okay, things that you need to think, one day old, bilis vomiting, it's green grass. I think the next thing you need to think of is gradually distending abdomen. So the abdomen is big, okay? Usually baby don't cry. When they're unwell, they are very tired. They look sick, okay? And they don't feed. They don't pee, they don't poo, they don't feed. Okay, so what do you think of? Yes, bovulus, malrotation, bang on. Yes, yes. So that's the first thing you need to think of until proven otherwise. So malrotation, bovulus, you need to think about one. They have intermittent bilious vomiting, okay? It usually happens in the neonatal period, okay? Quite common in the prem, okay? So they don't usually cry or irritable. They usually are quite quiet very suddenly. They have a distended abdomen and sometimes they are bleeding from the lower end. And this is a surgical emergency. So what do I do? Okay, I have witnessed few malrotation bovulus before in the district hospital. It's a not nice thing to do, okay? So first thing I want you to understand what happened, okay? Again, I already told you that it might happen or more commonly in a prem baby. So why, if you think about your anatomy or your um, embryology, so this is how your tummy should look like, okay? This is how your tummy should look like. However... Your embryology just didn't seem that they want to work in the right way. So the DJ flexure is the main region. The spread out, the mesenteric didn't spread out quite well in the right direction. 
And also on top of that, what happens is your bowel tends to twist around it. So what happens in volvulus is the twisting of the entire bowel. So first it's mal rotates and then it starts to twist. And then it happens and causes bowel ischemia, infarction, but more commonly it presents with perforation, okay? And again, I want to drill into your head. It causes bilious vomiting, abdominal distension. Yes, pain, but usually they're very sick. PR from the bottom end is a no-no. Okay, yes, you can do upper GI contrast. Okay, so this is what you see. You see, do, 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 and then suddenly, oops, not happening. Okay, so it's not really specific. You really need the help of senior members. Okay, so please, if you are in doubt, like me, always, all I do is when I see on the pillow, that's when they show me the new needs or the midwife will say it's it's green grass vomiting. And when I look at the pillow, if I think it is, I ask them stop feeding, okay? Call my registrar and then start attempting for NG tube, new by mouth, try to put in a cannula, do a PFA, and then go from there, ring the surgeons. Usually that's what we do. And then after that, the, if the PFA suggests any kind of obstruction, then you go ahead and call the radiology. But usually, if it is a nice radiologist, they will come in straight away and do. Sorry, PFA is a very Irish, sorry, I'm Irish trained, so it's a very Irish way of saying that. It's a plain phlegm of the abdomen. Sorry, star. Okay, last but not least. A term male, again it's male, born by SVD, uneventful pregnancy, noted to have poor feeding, unfortunately not poo pooing. So what is what should you think? Yes, hushbrang, 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 very good, very good. Okay. So usually what you do is you do a PFA, you look for gas, and I think this one is very well illustrated. Look at this. Gas means dark. No gas means more white. And you look at the lower end, there's no gas. Oh, oh, okay. So it means there's no gas in the rectum. Okay, something is blocked. You need, an, you need a surgeon, basically. Okay. Sometimes some smart people want to do fancy tests and then they might do a barium animal examination. Now, I'm not saying they don't do, okay? In fact, I was taught a little trick. So I'm trained, I'm very, very lucky. I was trained by Professor Prem Puri, who has written a lot of surgical books. And I happened to do six months of pediatric surgery with him. I learned so much. So what he asked me to do is actually, okay, um, put, okay, what he asked me to do when this patient is going for barium enema, what he wants is me to put or stick on the patient is a coin on uh, the L5 region, okay? So what he wants to see is he wants to see how extensive it is when he does the barium enema. And so he knows at what level it is just by looking at where my coin is sitting at. I think that's a very, very smart way of, yeah, he just taught me a lot of tricks. And I think that's very, very good. Okay, so what you're looking for is the reduction of diameter and that tell me, is it a sigmoid or is it the large bowel? Where is it happening? Okay. Now, the textbook will always tell you that's because, okay, what happens is the, the myenteric plexus doesn't have ganglion cells and that's why there's the histological findings and that's why that's how Hirschsprung happens. Now, can I just ask, what is the golden diagnosis? Golden standard of diagnosing Hirschsprung. Is it imaging or is it something else? Biopsy, very well done, okay? 
So the golden standard of diagnosing Hirschsprung is not imaging, it's biopsy, it's rectal biopsy. I've done it myself a few times. All you have to do is like putting a lighter, like in the gun format, stick it in, and then you do a circular motion of probably nine to 10 samples around it. And then uh, you send it, okay? But while waiting for it, this doesn't mean that we won't do anything, okay? While waiting for it, usually the surgeons, or sometimes myself, or when I was an SHO, they will let you train, okay? So we do dilatation of the, the anus, okay? And then we slowly, slowly try to dilate with a very small to a very large tube. Hopefully, while waiting for the biopsy, that will help us to fix it if possible. And sometimes you can see meconium passing, sometimes no. Okay, for those that is yes, that's good. So we will tend to do frequent bowel washout. Okay, so that also suggests that it might be a very low sigmoid colon. Okay, and we just keep doing dilatation and do washout and that might fix it. But unfortunately, those that are at a higher level, that's a bit sad, okay? So what happened? Yes, so we do suction, we do contrast enema. What happens if it is really high up in the level, we have to do a pull through procedure. It is not nice. And I can tell you, I have existed a few times before. It is close to a six to eight hours procedure. It is not nice. So it's not an anastomosis, okay? So you have to find where the end is viable and you have to pull it right into the anal region and then you sew it up. It's a very complicated, it's not a nice procedure and it's very tedious. And again, I'm proud to say it's part of uh, Prem Puri's kind of procedure. I think he's one of them that invented this pull through procedure, which again, I witnessed under him. So I'm very lucky. Okay, so that's all I have to teach. I hope I have helped you to understand what is needed from a medical student point of view about pediatric surgery. Any questions? Before everyone heads off, Please, please, please complete this feedback form for Dr. Tan, Joy, because it will be incredibly useful for her. Yeah, Huria, I also wanted to teach on that. Unfortunately, I want to throw you guys to the easy end first. And if I, well, if it is possible, I, will, I have a part two on pediatric surgery. So that will be more of that. Okay, thank you very much on a Friday evening. Everybody have a good weekend. Bye everyone. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you very much for your time. No problem. Uh, guys, remember, fill out that feedback form. Uh, Joy will be incredibly appreciative of that. And hopefully there'll be a part two which we can organize in advance. Um, if, the, if any other lectures or topics you guys want to cover, then just email us and hopefully we'll get to that. Um, as soon as possible. Thank you very much and have a lovely Friday evening in 